Is the BBC totally ideologically? No. <laughs> How are you? Tell me a little bit about um, your, your background and your channel. Yes. Well, um, according to uh, the enemies of the channel, I'm funded by uh, CIA, Mossad, MI6, CCP, FSB, the Iranian regime and all that. But uh, <laughs> That's great. We're done. Thank exactly. you. Let's yeah. go. <laughs> but uh, so um, for those who don't know, obviously I'm um, ethnicity wise, I'm Persian. Mm -hmm. I was born in Iran. Uh, my mother was a political refugee, um, an accidental one. Uh, we'll get into that in a bit. Um, and uh, so I came here as a child. And uh, then I got into politics. Big mistake. There's no money in it. <laughs> and um, then accidentally, I started the YouTube channel. I, um, I was just frustrated over the Brexit negotiations days. Theresa May wasn't making a mess. So I was just basically making videos about that. So everything I have is actually thanks to Theresa May. So <laughs> thank you, Theresa. Well done, Theresa. And, and then, um, then it just became uh, the go-to channel for a lot of people for daily news and everything else. Um, and uh, now I'm here now. So. <laughs> well, you're, you look, you're one of the people who paved the way for channels like this to be able to do what they do. So I and we, whoever they are, thank you for that. <laughs> I appreciate um, it. And, and with that in mind, I mean, the other side of that is the BBC. Is the BBC totally captured ideologically by the woke or the woke left or the left? It, it really depends um, how we define it, because um, when we say the left, um, the, we'll, we'll have to basically mean, you know, decades ago when the left were the left. Hmm. The left, by definition, has been anti-establishment. And uh, so at different times, different countries, they meant different things. So Marxism or 200 years ago, 150 years ago, it was liberalism in this country. Then certain things become status quo. So this country is by nature now classical liberal. You know, the, the conservatives conserve, um, you know, values of democracy and small governments and free free market, free speech and all that. But the the left that we are talking about, they over the last few months, yes, they are ideological. But now that they've captured, so yes, they have. They're no longer left. I don't call them the left. So they, they are the establishment. Uh, it's interesting when, for example, just going sidetrack. People like Greta Thunberg and the, the, her friends go out there outside these conferences. Uh, the, you know, the international institutions protest for net zero, but inside the building they've already accepted net zero. So yeah. it's interesting that they are still seeing themselves as rebellion. But you are the establishment. So the likes of the BBC, and there are so many examples over the years. In perfect example during the Brexit days, and their bias being shown so obviously, they still see themselves as, hey, we, we, we are actually against establishment. We're holding the power to account. You are the power. <laughs> That's the problem. Yeah, the BBC certainly is. Um, I suppose they might say, um, oh, but but the but the people or the power or, you know, Brexit won. Yeah. And we were they were sort of quite Remainy. So they would say they were counterculture in that sense. Yeah, but it, it, that's the interesting thing because... Um, even the liberal left until recent times, um, and you know, the, the, the comedy primarily came from the, the liberal side. Um, and towards the, the last few decades, it became unfunny. But they didn't even realize it because uh, it, they changed. There, they used to punch up. The left used to punch up. Comedy used to punch up. You now, evil rich bankers and Tories and all that, right? Now they punch down. They say, Oh, these uh, fat white gammon Brexiteers uh, from Essex going to Benidorm. They're punching down now. So they still think they're delusional. They still think that, no, no, we're, we're talking Brexit is establishment, the power we're holding it to account. Yeah, but you're literally attacking just ordinary people that you see as educa uneducated and idiots. You're no longer attacking the rich bankers because you are the rich bankers. <laughs> you're, you're attacking the working class. Yeah, literally. Isn't yeah. it remarkable how they've managed to do that and they've got this kind of, this this mad paradox here where, we're oh yeah, we, we can only, I mean, I don't like that idea anyway of humour where you can only punch up. I know, yeah. Punch, punch everything. I mean, that's punch. why I like uh, Jimmy Carr, for example. He's one of yeah. my favourites. And, yeah. <laughs> and Ricky Gervais. Yeah, so they, they punch, punch up and down. It's, it's a joke. Joke is a joke. Yeah. Uh, if you have a position that we have to only punch up or punch down, that means you already have a position. It's yeah. a political position. Yeah. So that's the problem. Uh, but no, they're, they're completely insane. They, they don't get it. I mean, but there's a reason that the work, attacking working classes is, is, and the failure of it, it's the same reason that Karl Marx admitted back then. Marx said, my ideology is spreading, but I have a problem with the, uh, the English and British working class. They don't listen. They, they are not surrendering mm. to Marxism, basically, um, compared to the other Europeans, for example. Even he and his followers realize uh, that there's something about the British culture that you know you can't really tell them what to do. So we didn't we didn't become Marxists. Um, most European nations cultures at some point they became socialist. -y. Hmm. Uh, we've had socialist leaning governments, but the people are not socialists. Um, so the left now it makes sense that ended up attacking the working classes, whether they know it or not. 
the same reason that Karl Marx ended up attacking the working classes in Britain. Interesting. Yeah. What do you think that is about the British resolve? It's the it's the history. It's the it's the heritage. Uh, each nation has a journey, has a story, um, and the 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 developed world by nature they've had a successful story, but ups and downs. This country, for various reasons, um, in terms of the origin, and by origin we're talking about, just before William the Conqueror, or they call him William the Bastard, came <laughs> to conquer in 1066, because before that you had the Anglo-Saxons, um, and uh, then you had the local barons and all the kingdoms inside a tiny island. It, everyone talks about Magna Carta and all this stuff, but before Magna Carta, we already had the concept of governed by consent, it was called. So it was essentially like local democracy, but it was the upper classes, and uh, make sure you get the consent of the local baron. So the, the, from that those days, whether you want to call them Anglo-Saxon, the, the English, or the Brits, or whatever they are, were always resistant towards authority, but not in an American way. Because Americans say, no, no, we're resistant to authority, so we will give you power, the government, you know, governed by, by the power, uh, by the people, from the people, whatever, uh, for the people. But in this country, there's always been a relationship between the establishment and the common people. The common people accepted that power comes from the top and freedoms come from the top. But there was a handshake agreement that both sides knew. Okay, don't become a tyrant and you respect the rule of law. So that's why we never really technically had any proper dictatorship. We had like 10 minutes. Uh, well, Charles I went crazy. Then Oliver Cromwell, everyone said, oh, that's the solution. He became a dictator. Then 10 minutes later, we was like, yeah, let's just go back to constitutional monarchy. Compared to many other countries, we didn't really experience dictatorship or tyranny in that sense. Um, and I think this is just the part of the character of these people. Speaking of tyranny and the BBC, <laughs> oh dear. I'm good at the segues here. Who's the, the butcher of Tehran and what did the BBC say about his legacy? Oh, God. Uh, they, they, I love that the, the BBC obviously like reported him uh, because everything is so interconnected. Um, what, what they call, the United Nations called it the, the world order since the 40s and 50s. So there are all these institutions from the UN to the IMF and all the others, NATO, that because they're official institutions, they have credibility, right? So the BBC would treat the Iranian regime just like how they would treat the Canadian government. And that's a problem. Back in the days, we wouldn't have done that. If you have a rogue nation, we would have treated them as you are rogue. But because it's part of the UN and the UN gives them a, a, a seat at the Human Rights Commission or the Women's Rights Commission, which is hilarious. Uh, the BBC have been going around to paying pay, pay respect and all the, uh, covering all the other idiots, paying respect to the President Raisi. The man was literally called the Bush of Tehran because he was uh, the first uh, senior judge or supreme judge after the 1979 paramilitary coup when the Islamic occupation happened. And he was young. He had no experience, like legal experience, and he became the judge. And he was conducting five-minute trials, and uh, official figures says uh, at least 5,000 people were executed wow. under him, but actually it's much more. Um, it, this is just the figures eventually they gave out to the international community. And then, then he became, obviously, he got to the top, became president, and then, of course, there have been some divisions between him and uh, the supreme leader, because he wanted to be supreme leader. So there's a lot of theories about why he died. Oh, maybe just a good timing coincidence for the supreme leader. I can imagine him having a party that night uh, after the crash. But the BBC and all these guys, you had the, the European Union bringing down their flag, the uh, the UN, like paying wow. respect as if it's some sort of Gandhi character. Like, would you do that if Yahya Sinwa of Hamas dies? Yes. Would you do that if uh, uh, Hassan Nasrallah of Hezbollah died? I think they would. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised at this point. Yeah, I really think they might. I think yeah. they might. But the thing is, you you, you have to treat someone like Racy the same way you treated uh, Bin Laden when we killed him. Mm. But because Bin Laden was not part of any entity that was linked to the UN officially, you're you're allowed to celebrate when he died. Everybody in the US US government said, "Yeah, we did it." But Racy, no, 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 you're not allowed to celebrate. But isn't it also? Um since bin laden <clears throat> dies there's been a bit of a change in the culture uh and going back to what we were talking about with sort of who's in charge at the bbc and all of these cultural institutions i mean a lot of people have started reassessing bin laden's history as well oh Is yeah because he, he was woke <laughs> yes yeah he was sort of woke i gather i mean he also went to a posh school yep. from what i can understand he came from a rich family as well he also went against his own culture uh to try and spread some kind of righteous nonsense yep and didn't accept anyone who thought differently from him. It's, it's fascinating. Um, it's always been the same. So from my perspective, 
the the biggest two threats to what we call the Western system, Western cultures are right now. There are a number of threats, but um, the biggest collectives are what what I call the far left, and the, you know it's a wider group, and also the the Islamists, the extremist Islamists, ideological ones. But the and these people there they are similar. That's why at times they see themselves as allies because they're both against the power, people power, all that the the, the illusion of it. Mm. But both sides, the Islamist extremist side, and of course the far left and woke side, or whatever you want to call it, all their heroes were not the common man. Look at, for example, Karl Marx, this intellectual living in Soho, pretending mm. that oh, I'm just one of you guys. Ayatollah Khomeini uh, of Iran, rich man. Uh, bin Laden, private school. You had uh, even Bashar al-Assad, a uh, dictator, going to private school here and in Switzerland. Every single one of them, they, they, even the heroes of the left, and they're all basically like that posh. They're all like rich. They're all successful. They're all also white men. What happened to your leaders? And you, you're claiming, and um, like for a short period of time, mm. Prince Harry became their hero. And like, mm -hmm. but the, these guys are not the common man. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah well, what are you doing? <laughs> I, I would take issue with Osama bin Laden being a white man. I mean, <laughs> he was quite. He was quite light skin. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I suppose he was. I suppose he was. I, yeah, I think there's there's that myth. I've I've been learning a little bit about that pervading the culture. There's a myth of the working class resistance, yep. which apparently rarely actually happens. Like Les Mis didn't Les, Les Miserables, for those who don't um who do who wanted to hear me say it frenchly 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 yeah. frenchly i said it very frenchly um apparently this idea the working class are rising up and really it, it tends to be when the middle class are disaffected when they're annoyed and that's you know i don't like what's happening to my kids at school that's when things start to kick off yeah i mean um democratically or even revolutionary and um, that's why for example for a long time and things are changing now in british politics for example People like David Cameron and on the other side, Tony Blair, kept focusing on what they call the center ground. It's not the center ground. We don't have centrism in this country. They're basically talking about the middle class professional people who are not ideological this way or the other, but they vote all the time because they pay taxes and they, you know, and they, they, they have opinions. You know, they like to moan, they like to gossip, you know, and, and they're very much uh, uh, involved in society and they vote. That's why people like uh, Cameron were always resistant to. Uh, right wingers it's saying don't make the Tory party too much right wing because uh, we can't rely on them to come out to vote. Technically, they were right, um, but it changed, especially 2015 16 onwards. Uh, we saw with Brexit, we saw with Trump, even Le Pen in, in France. It's now changed. I've been actually, I'm now hearing from the so called centrist liberals and the pundits and um, even media commentators who are now saying, even they admit that you can't focus on the so-called center ground right now just pick a side you don't have to go extreme far right far left or this or that just basically if you're a conservative party just do the conservative policies they will vote for you because it's in fact it's the center ground people the middle classes who might not come out to vote now because now they think oh my god uh tories are so right wing and labor so this uh, they might not actually come out and the local elections proved that recently so it's the actual right wingers and the left wingers you know the corbyn fans and you know the, or the trump fans on this side who or Nigel Farage fans, they would come out to vote. Um, but there are still people in, for example, the Tory party who are still thinking, no, 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 no. Let's just focus on saying, what, what do you mean center ground? <laughs> it, it doesn't exist. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's, that's, it's, that's so, man, that, that's mad to me. It's just yeah. mad to me. So that's been changing, I think, of everything. <laughs> yeah. And then I suppose the woke it, it tends to also be obviously the middle class, the liberal elite, as they say. Champagne socialists, as yes. I call them. But, I, learned, I learned a thing uh, the other day, nostalgie de la boue, uh, <laughs> nostalgia of the dirt or the yeah. mud. Uh, in, in, in France, sort of a lot of middle class people started dressing like the peasants. Yes. Because that was like a way to be different in status exactly uh, like, oh look at you boring middle class people i'm the ones yeah. with the different clothes but that it goes back to france again because um, the reason i mentioned the the, the central ground of middle class is because you mentioned obviously in terms of revolutions but even democratically and um, always worry about the middle classes losing out or feeling that they're losing out in a Kosovo crisis it was the middle classes that were affected um, but felt more affected then um, the people at the bottom they were already affected anyway and mm. um, obviously objectively a lot of them were like, oh, I'm now paying even 500 pounds even more in energy bills. So yeah, I know they're suffering more, but it's not a new thing for, mm -hmm. for them in terms of problems, everyday problems. But when the middle class is like, oh, I have to pay a little bit more taxes now, then when they moan, worry about that. Uh, so in Iran, obviously, like, you know, the uprisings are going on. And every 10 years since 1979, there's been an attempt when you had just students and like, you know, people at the bottom, like rising up and it didn't really happen. Now you got the working classes and the middle classes, again, like France. Now the regime is worried. Yeah, that's when it starts.